All right. So I will welcome everyone once again to our uh, geophysics and tectonics seminar. Uh, this week we have uh, Magalie Billen from the UC Davis who will be talking to us about um, subduction, I guess deep slab submissivity, uh, and showing us some cool videos. Uh, and so uh, thank you, Magalie, for being here and go ahead. All right. Thank you so much, Keely, for inviting me. This has been a really great uh, seminar series to enjoy attending this uh, summer so far. And um, I'm really happy to have the opportunity to share the recent work that I have been doing on deep slab seismicity. Um, probably some of you know me from doing subduction dynamics, and I haven't uh, really done anything related to seismicity of deep earthquakes before. So this is a, this is a new direction for my research. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I want to make sure, there we go. Oh no, the thing that we tried in terms of moving it didn't just work. Hold on, there we go, okay. All right, so um, I wanna explain a little bit how I got into uh, working on deep slab um, seismicity. And this uh, came from the fact that I had a student that was working on these subduction models, Katrina Arredondo, and she finished her PhD and decided not to continue in uh, academics. She went on to do hydrological mo modeling as a consultant. Um, so I was left to write up really the rest of her PhD in papers. And so I was uh, analyzing her models and replotting things. And one day I decided to plot the strain rate within the slab as the slab was deforming. And um, I, so these are, this is a, a, a picture of a, a subducting slab and it's only a zoom in on a portion of, a, of the model, just showing you where the slab is. And the colors are showing you the log of the strain rate. So going from higher values on the order of greater than 10 to the minus 15 to lower values of less than 10 to the minus, minus 16. And what you can see in here is that the strain rate actually varies in the slab as it is deforming. And this is expected. We have nonlinear rheology in this model, but I'd never plotted this and looked at it before. And um, at the same time I plotted this uh, movie with the color scale, I also made this other plot, which plots, which is showing the maximum strain rate as a function of depth. Um, within particular temperature contours. And so this allowed me to see, you know, within, if I'm looking at just between 1,000 and 900 degrees C, uh, what is the maximum strain rate within that temperature band? And as soon as I saw this plot, I was reminded of another plot um, that I have seen over the years, which is the global profile of slab seismicity. And this profile um, is shown in almost every paper that discusses deep slab seismicity and has had a really, um, uh, outsized influence on how we interpret and think about the mechanisms that cause the deep earthquakes. So as soon as I saw this, I asked myself, what is the relationship between long-term slab deformation strain rate? For example, if you look at this profile, there are these, these peaks within the strain rate profile, and these peaks are changing with time. And this is very reminiscent of the peaks that we see in this global seismicity plot. So what is the relationship between long-term slab deformation, the strain rate in the slab, and the distribution of deep earthquakes? And when I asked myself this question, I expected to find people who had really looked at this question of, you know, what is the effect of strain rate? And um, to my surprise, I, I found one paper, which I will get to later, but strain rate really hasn't been um, focused on and thought about in terms of deep earthquakes. So today I'm gonna to, uh, talk to you about this in sort of a, a story of four acts. Um, first, I'm going to present some observations of deep earthquakes. I realize most people don't spend their time thinking about deep earthquakes, and I needed a good reminder about the observations when I went back into this. And the main thing to take away from this is that deep earthquakes are a bit enigmatic. They're very similar to shallow earthquakes, but clearly they have to have a different failure mechanism. Second, I'm going to talk about deep earthquake failure mechanisms and what the um, proposed mechanisms are and the problems with, in particular, transformational faulting as, as being the only parameter and also uh, the only possible mechanism and also how thinking about that mechanism has limited our overall thinking about how deep earthquakes might actually occur. Um, so find the next step I'll talk about is looking at the observed strain rate in slabs. So if we wanna link the strain rate that's in these subduction models to the strain rate in slabs, we have to somehow have an estimate of what the seismic strain rate is in slabs and think about how that's related to the long-term um, deformation. And then the final part I'll talk about are dynamic models of subduction. And I'll argue by comparing these dynamic models of subduction to the observed strain rates that by considering the, um, the 
control of strain rate on where deep seismicity occurs, we can better explain the spatial distribution of deep earthquakes. We can make progress on understanding the failure mechanism, and um, we can link the short and long time scale dynamics and subduction zones. So let me get started with the observations of deep earthquakes. So deep earthquakes occur in the cold slab interior, and there um, we can split up the earthquakes into shallow earthquakes uh, at less than 60 kilometers depth. That's sort of the seismicity that we're all used to thinking about. Um, intermediate depth earthquakes are roughly between 60 and 300 kilometers depth. And then deep earthquakes are really those earthquakes that happen deeper than 300 kilometers. And I'll get back to where this, this division between intermediate and deep comes from in a, in a moment. Um, the deep earthquakes uh, occur within the transition zone between 400 and our several phase transitions, which affect the dynamics of the slab and may also affect um, uh, wh why we have deep seismicity um, and where that seismicity occurs. Um, these uh, phase transitions include the olivine phase transitions to Wadsleyite and Ringwoodite. Uh, one of the mechanisms for deep earthquake uh, assumes that um, the olivine may not actually transform under uh, equilibrium conditions at 410 kilometers, and therefore you can end up with this wedge of olivine that's at higher pressure conditions than it would be normally stable, and we call this metastable olivine. I'll also point out that there are other phase transitions happening here besides the olivine phase transitions, right? 40% of the mantle is not olivine, it's pyroxenes and garnets, and there are phase transitions occurring within those minerals as well in the transition zone. Uh, okay, so uh, deep earthquakes are um, important because they uh, define, in fact, where subducting plates go into the uh, uppermost lower mantle. The seismicity goes down to about 680 kilometers, and so in many places, this seismicity really tells us the shape of the slab, its geometry, and uh, how it's deforming as it goes into the upper mantle. Um, this uh, zone of uh, roughly planar zone of earthquakes is referred to as the Wadadi Benioff zone. And Wadadi was the first person to recognize that seismic waves uh, arriving in Japan were coming from deep within the earth. So let me go back to this uh, global deep earthquake seismicity and this, this uh, seismicity profile, which I mentioned before. So this um, profile um, has uh, normally been split up into this section of intermediate depth earthquakes, which are these earthquakes which start with a very large number of earthquakes at less than 100 kilometers depth and then decays rapidly down to about 300 kilometers. Note that what I'm plotting here is the number of earthquakes per year in a 10 kilometer bin. Okay, so the, and this is a logarithmic scale. Um, so the, these are the uh, intermediate depth earthquakes and then our deep earthquakes have a peak within the transition zone. They start to increase at around 500 kilometers, peak within the, the bottom part of the transition zone, and then rapidly drop off with no earthquakes um, occurring deeper than about 680 kilometers. So these two different um, uh, sections of this profile have led to the idea that there is a different failure mechanisms for the shallow earthquakes, uh, sorry, the intermediate earthquakes, and for these deep earthquakes. And the section where you have sort of either um, just uniform amount of seismicity or maybe a slight peak comes from sort of a crossover region where both of these failure mechanisms may be active. Okay, so this, um, this is really why we split these things up into intermediate and deep earthquakes, uh, uh, taking from the seismicity the idea that this is telling us about two different mechanisms occurring at different depths and under different conditions within the mantle. Okay, but there's one thing that we don't see in this global seismicity profile, and that is that there's a lot of variation in seismicity when you look at different subduction zones. Uh, Tonga is one of my favorites, it's where I did my PhD, and um, Tonga is a really anomalous subduction zone. It accounts for uh, more than half of the global seismicity in slabs. It's very active, but it also has, um, it tends to have not very large events. So you don't get big magnitude eights in, in Tonga, you get, you, but you get a lot of magnitude sixes. Um, you can also see in the map view and in these two example cross sections that the shape of the slab is not perfectly linear. There's actually even places where it may buckle um, and fold into the, into the um, mantle. And in other places, even though you see these dark blue uh, 
uh, earth, earthquakes indicating very deep earthquakes, the actual maximum depth varies um, along the profile. Uh, so this is a, a sort of one end member with, which is very active and has a lot of earthquakes. We can look at another end member example, which is the Chilean slab. The Chilean also has large gaps in seismicity. And so this is two profiles. Um, the one here is from this section, and then two is from more of the flat slab section a little bit further south. Uh, what's interesting about both of these is that there are these large areas of the slab in which there's no seismicity, but then there is this big cluster of seismicity right around or just above 600 kilometers depth. And we have to ask ourselves if the, how does the mechanism of these earthquakes explain the fact that there are both deep earthquakes, but there's a region in between which has no earthquakes at all. What is, what are the conditions that are controlling the fact that you can get these deeper earthquakes, but in between you're not meeting the set of physical requirements necessary to, uh, to trigger earthquakes in the intervening period. Okay, so um, I'll touch um, briefly on rupture mechanism here to just talk about a few more observations. And uh, one of the first ideas about rupture mechanisms for deep earthquakes was the thought that maybe these are due to an implosion uh, due to phase changes. This is not the reason. Um, the, the, but I'll just explain for a second the thinking. The idea was that these deep earthquakes happen in the transition zone where you're taking um, uh, shallower low pressure phases and going through uh, increasing pressure and creating denser phases. So if these um, episodes of phase tra transitions happened uh, very rapidly, you could have a rapid um, change in volume and this perhaps could be a way of actually triggering deep earthquakes. However, what we find is that the focal mechanisms for deep earthquakes um, very much follow a double couple solution. They are more complex and they have a component which shows that maybe the, um, the slab um, surface may involve actually multiple slab surfaces with different geometries, um, but they are um, uh, indicative of a shear failure and a, a, a double couple source, just like we see for shallow uh, earthquakes. So this is interesting, right? There, there's, we, they have this shear um, deformation mechanism, but they also have some differences compared to shallow events. So uh, I won't, I'll just go through a few examples, but I'll point out two excellent references for learning about deep earthquakes. One of them is this chapter from uh, the treatise on geophysics from Heidi Houston. And this is this, this section which goes through a lot of observations of what we know about deep earthquakes. And the other one is this um, book by Cliff Frolic called Deep Earthquakes. And this is really funny because I often tell my students that the things that we're researching can't be find, found in books. You have to read journal articles. But this is the one topic where there's actually a book. And it's a really great book. So, so if you're really interested in deep earthquakes, I recommend checking this out from the library. So what do we learn in terms of some major um, differences between deep earthquakes and, um, and shallow earthquakes? So the first thing is that deeper earthquakes have shorter rupture durations for a given size. They have a larger range of rupture velocities, um, including even super shear, um, very rapid rupture velocities. They are more complex. They have evidence of multiple sub-events um, compared to um, shallow events. And they have a larger range of stress drops on the order of one to 150 megapascals, and maybe even as high as 250 megapascals in some examples. It's very hard to constrain stress drops for deep earthquakes. So this is something that um, is, um, it's clear there's a larger range, but the exact magnitudes is, is difficult to constrain. The last thing is that these earthquakes have uh, fewer aftershocks than shallow events. And there's even some depth ranges in which seem to be completely void of aftershocks. So this um, suggests that whatever the mechanism is for these earthquakes, that the, the stress release is different. You don't leave sort of a cascade of other high stress regions. You're so, somehow able to really release all of the stress within a, a given area or, or most of it. So um, what these uh, observations tell us is that these deep earthquakes are generally actually similar to shallow earthquakes. There's some differences which may be telling us something about the failure mechanism or something about the difference in the physical state, so how that failure mechanism is able to really stress. Uh, but without knowing actually what the mechanism is, it's hard to connect these observations and the differences um, to actually pro progress in terms of understanding deep earthquakes. Okay, 
So let me move on to what these failure mechanisms actually, uh, the proposed failure mechanisms are. So first, just a quick reminder about how shallow earthquakes occur. Um, shallow earthquakes occur due to um, brittle failure. You have compression, you create tiny little opening cracks. These opening cracks sort of nucleate along um, a boundary. And then um, as they interconnect, you get a shear failure where these, um, these micro cracks actually connect together. For this type of mechanism, um, doesn't work for deep earthquakes because this is um, strongly pressure limited. As you increase the normal stress, it becomes very difficult to open tensile cracks. So there has to be some other mechanism that leads to really a brittle failure, right? It's an earthquake, but through some different sort of uh, mechanism. So for intermediate earthquakes, the two main um, hypotheses is that there is dehydration and brittlement. So uh, uh, dehydration reactions, releasing water, reducing pore fluid pressure, and then through that, allowing a normal brittle failure to occur. Um, uh, another um, uh, me uh, mechanism which has been gaining a lot of attention in the last, I would say, 10 to 15 years is shear instability. And I just realized I mistyped that, shear instability. No, it's fine. Okay. Um, so um, this uh, shear instability is, um, I'll explain in a second, this it, uh, with a, a figure. This has been shown to be a possibility both from field observations in the range of 60 to 100 kilometers in exhumed um, localities and also based on lab experiments. For deep earthquakes, the main mechanism that people have focused on is transformational faulting um, or more recently uh, a proposal that there's a combination of transformation faulting and shear instability. So let me just describe these two um, shear instability and transformational faulting because these are the two that we uh, think may be applicable to deep earthquakes. So this is a, a figure from uh, John et al of uh, Nature Geoscience and it's actually reproduced in a recent review paper by Zhang Wenzhan. And it shows on, in the picture on the left, a uh, exhumed pseudotaculite fault vein, um, and uh, they, um, which is indicative of melting on this, fault, uh, on this fault. And what the picture on the left shows is a series of um, uh, time steps from a numerical simulation in which they start with a, a, a perturbation in, in physical properties with a narrow zone, and they start to deform this zone in shear. And as you get progressive shear, you eventually melt within this region um, by, so you heat, and eventually you get a, a thermal runaway, which cre um, creates a spike in temperature and melting along this interface. So that's the idea of, sh of uh, shear instability. A perturbation in properties allows you to localize, localize strain rates at high stress. This leads to heating and then thermal runaway. The other mechanism is transformational faulting of metastable olivine. And um, this is actually in some ways very similar to brittle faulting, but instead of having tensile cracks, what you do is through compressive stress, you are nucleating um, a, a higher density phase. So in this example, going from an olivine to a spinel within tiny little lenses within the rock. If you can create a, a bunch of these little lenses, just like the tensile cracks, these can coalesce together in order to create a through-going fault. Now, what's interesting about the material within these lenses is that they are, um, you are nucleating nano-sized grains of spinel, in which case they create a thin superplastic layer. And this allows you to drastically weaken the rock and allow for brittle failure. So the transformational faulting uh, hypothesis has been one of the leading hypothesis for deep earthquakes for some time. And it makes some specific predictions about what we should see in terms of deep seismicity. First of all, the, um, the transformational faulting occurs within a temperature window and um, under um, where you have the metastable olivine within a wedge going down through the transition zone. And those temperatures are met the temperature conditions are met basically all along the outside of this metastable wedge. So you would predict that there should be continuous bands, or maybe if this is very narrow, you wouldn't be able to distinguish bands, but a continuous zone of seismicity because you have these regions where the temperature conditions are exactly what you need to go from metastable olivine to um, through transformational faulting uh, to the um, deeper phase. Um, the other prediction is that the maximum depth should correlate with the slab thermal parameter, basically how cold the slab is. And that's because how, the depth to which this mid, um, 
metastable olivine wedge is, is stable, how deep it would go would be directly proportional to how cold the slab is. So this is in good agreement with the global seismicity, right? This idea that you, you know, if you sort of push everything together, you see that there's this um, slab seismicity that extends all the way through to the 660. However, if we look in detail, there's a few problems with this. One is when you look at, um, for example, the Chilean slab or the slab beneath Peru, where you have these gaps. If the temperature is sufficient at a depth of 600 kilometers to get these deep earthquakes, why do we have a gap above that in which we have no earthquakes? Okay, the temperature conditions, there should be temperature conditions all the way down to that point, which are appropriate for transformational faulting to occur. Um, the other thing is that the maximum depth of seismicity does not increase in a continuous manner proportional to the thermal parameter. So this other plot here shows from Kirby, the deepest earthquake as a function of thermal parameter going from warm slabs to cold slabs. And what we see is that there's a, a basically a discontinuity. So there's, there's an increase and a flattening out for very warm slabs, and then a jump where all of these slabs, sort of irrespective of their thermal parameter, have deep earthquakes that go all the way down to 660 kilometers. Um, even though you would predict that the, the warmer slabs should have shallower, um, uh, a shallower maximum depth of seismicity. The final problem is that when you do, when there are um, simulations done um, trying to model um, metastable olivine wedges, you need very old slabs, older than 100 million years old, in order to get these um, very long metastable olivine wedges that go all the way down to 660 kilometers. Okay, so this suggests that there may be some, some challenges to the transformational faulting, and this is one of the reasons why people have started looking also at um, shear instability or some combination of factors for explaining deep earthquakes. So what's missing here? Something clearly is missing from our current understanding, which cannot explain these gaps in seismicity, the observed variability in rates of seismicity, or the lack of strong dependence on the thermal parameter. So let's go back up to something that we, we actually know, okay, shallow earthquakes, all right? So shallow earthquakes are caused by accumulation of strain, right? And seismicity is high at plate boundaries, as we can see in this map, where the deformation is localized and strain rates are high. Seismicity is low in plate interiors where strain rates are low. So we have high strain rates that lead to strain accumulation, and the strain accumulation is what leads to earthquakes at shallow depths. So how can we take this thinking into deep earthquakes, okay? So what about these failure mechanisms in deep earthquakes? Do they depend on strain rate? So the first thing is that the shear instability model explicitly depends on strain rate, right? The higher the strain rate is, as long as your stress, background stress is high enough, and you have some way to localize that strain rate, then you can lead to shear instability. We don't know whether that can happen at the conditions for very deep earthquakes. And so that's this work that needs to be done in the future. But we do know that it explicitly depends on strain rate. So the other question is whether transformational faulting also occurs, on, depends on strain rate. And here I'm pointing to, the, this is actually the original paper on the experiments done for transformational faulting with Pamela Burnley and Harry Green. And it came out, there was a big science or nature paper, I can't remember which one, that Harry Green was the first author on. And then Pamela Burnley was, a, I think, a postdoc or a graduate student, I can't remember, working with Harry at the time. And then she wrote up all of the experiments um, for that, uh, for this new mechanism for deep focus earthquakes. And one interesting thing is, as you dive into that paper, is there is this plot of stress versus natural strain. And there's two curves. Uh, one here that peaks is at, fast, is at a fast strain rate. And the other one that kind of curves off and dies is at a slow strain rate. And you can read in the text here that it shows that the transformational faulting actually depends on the strain rate. You have to be deforming at a fast enough strain rate in order to get the transformational faulting mechanism to work. If your strain rate is accumulating too slowly, you, have, you end up with just a steady state um, transformation with no faulting mechanism. So it turns out that metastable olivine uh, transformational faulting also depends on strain rate. Okay. So let me move then finally to what is the strain rate in, in slabs and how is it related to um, defor the deformation um, that we see in our slabs over long periods of time. 
So I'm going to use um, a way of estimating this, the strain rate from seismicity, which was uh, presented in a paper by Bevis in 1988. This is um, uh, this uh, approach uses the, the moment released within a volume of the slab and relates that to the area and the amount of slip um, so that you can actually estimate the strain rate. And I won't go into details of that, but you're basically summing up the moment release um, assuming that that uh, contributes to shortening or extension of the slab, and then from that estimating what the strain rate is. And this has been used to estimate the average minimum strain rate of slabs, just sort of on average to get it, um, to relate this to like how deformable a slab must be. Um, uh, in, I did this in my PhD looking at Tonga, and it's been done more recently um, by Elisic and in, in other cases as well. So what I would like to do that's different than that is use this to actually ask, how does the strain rate vary spatially? And because the strain rate here is, it's really summing moment, right? So it, what we should see is that where there is a lot of seismicity, the strain rates are high, right? As long as that seismicity is all basically about the same moment um, release. But we're explicitly going to go through and sum up the moment release and calculate the strain rate. So here are profiles um, that both show the seismicity in gray um, as a function of depth. So this is on the same scale as I use for the global sum of um, seismicity. And here we're actually going down to magnitudes greater than four. And then this green curve with the scale at the top is showing the logarithm of the strain rate. And what you can see is that these are basically proportional to each other, right? And that's because um, the, these earthquakes this, um, are are basically all have sort of a, a, the same sort of distribution of, of uh, earthquake sizes. So when you sum all of those up, those are going to be proportionally just equal to the strain rate. There are some exceptions. For example, here, if you look at the Marianas, there's this peak that's actually much higher. And that's because there are some particularly large events. And then those large events then weight the amount of strain rate that must be released in that area higher than just the number of events that you would see. So the other thing that I'd like you to get from these um, plots is that we've done these first for just individual subduction zones. And you can see that Tonga looks a lot like the global part because it, it basically has so much more seismicity than any other place. But when you look at these other profiles, what you can see is that there are sort of groups. Tonga, Kermadec, and Java, Sumatra all follow the global profile with a, a decay in, in strain rate and seismicity and then a peak in the transition zone. Chile and Peru, have this big gap of seismicity in the middle. And then the Marianas, Japan, and Kuriles um, are, in fact, don't have this big peak, right? Marianas has a little peak, it may be a second peak at around 500 kilometers, but Japan seismicity actually start, stops rather abruptly with only a few events deeper than that. And the Kuriles has the same um, problem, although it has some very large events. So even though it had, so it does, the, the strain rate peak does actually go much higher than the, what you would expect from the seismicity, okay? So what we can see is that there, if you look just starting to split up and look at individual um, uh, uh, subduction zones, there's a lot of variability in the seismicity and the strain rate release with depth. If we start to dig into this and look at individual profiles, here I'm showing an example for Java Sumatra um, with uh, split up into profiles looking at sort of 200 kilometer long sections of the, of the subduction zone. Um, each of these shows some variability where um, there are peaks that show up with at certain depths, um, but these depths are not always the same from one profile to the next profile. And I think the message that I want to send from this is that we do not want to ignore this variability, that this is actually telling us something about how the slab is deforming and that that deformation is not the same everywhere and that it's actually important for understanding where we have deep seismicity. And of course, whenever there's a good idea, you're never the first one to have it. <laughs> um, and it turns out there's this great paper from Tao and O'Connell in 1993, in which they did these very simple subduction models uh, where they had a weak slab. The slab actually has the same viscosity as the surrounding mantle. It's just being tracked sort of mechanically, like as, a, as an entity in a location. And what they showed is that the strain rate in the slab has the same sort of profile as the expected, as the seismicity, right? That you have this decay, the a peak and strain rate at sort of around 250, uh, 250 kilometers, it decays and then it increases again. And that this is, a, is simply a response to the 
um, resistance to sinking that the slab feels as there, it encounters a, a jump in viscosity between the upper and the lower mantle. So the problem with this slab is that it's, it's so weak that it's not really um, a very good uh, approximation of a slab. Slab should be much stronger. There's been a whole nother sort of approach to these deep earthquakes, which really focused on actually predicting stresses. So I just want to show you this other figure as an example of, okay, there's strain rates and strain rates are deforming, but there's a lot of papers in the literature that looked at stresses in slabs, but basically in slabs that aren't deforming. Like they fix geometry and they just predict from the buoyancy variations in the slab what stresses would be available. And they show that you actually have very high stresses available within the slab, greater than a gigapascal. These are due to variations in density and phase transitions. Um, but these are limited because this slab is not actually deforming. I can't tell where you, what this would do to the shape of the slab or where there might be higher or lower strain rates. So what happens if you let a strong slab like this actually deform? So that brings us to the last part of this, which is my models. And um, going back to the first model that I showed you at the beginning to kind of try to bring this all together. So what I'm, I'm going to sh show you are the results of 2D dynamics models of subduction. Um, I use, these are models that were done using the um, code SITCOM and they use 2D slice of a sphere. Uh, so basically you can think of this as being located at the equator. They go all the way down to the core mantle boundary and they're about 60 degrees longitude across. Uh, with free slip boundary conditions on the sides. And we, I impose an initial um, thermal boundary layer at the top, which defines the plate as a function of age. I use a half space cooling model. And there's a proto slab, which is, um, goes down to about 250 kilometers, which init initiates subduction. And then there's also an overriding plate, which has a fixed um, age, except where it comes to the corner where we actually have a ridge. And we also impose um, a fixed region of temperature and viscosity in this corner, which allows that overriding plate to really move back and forth in response to um, the dynamic motion of the slab. So the slab subduction location can actually migrate forward and backwards. Um, I use the extended Boussinesque approximation. This allows me to um, include shear heating and also the temperature variations due to uh, phase transitions. There's a composite viscosity with yielding, which I'll um, which allows there to be weakening in high str um, strain rate regions um, and weakening also within the slab. There are, um, it has a crust, Hartsbergite, and pyrolite composition, which I'll show in a second. And the phase transitions are composition dependent. So here's a zoom in of the initial slab structure. There's uh, a crustal layer in yellow, a Hartsbergite layer in green, and then the overriding plate is also layered. The, um, Crustal layer is assumed to be weaker at shallow depths, and then it strengthens as it goes through the basalt to eclogite transition. And this weak crustal region is very important because it decouples the subducting plate from the overriding plate and allows this boundary to move dynamically in response to the forces in the model. For the phase transitions, um, we are tracking both the olivine phase transitions and um, the major pyroxene and garnet phase transitions. So we have the olivine to wadsleyite phase transition, wadsleyite to ringwoodite, and then ringwoodite going to bridgmanite plus ferropericlase. But then you can see here that there's a bunch of other curves which are looking at sort of a calcium rich end member of garnet transitioning to calcium perovskite, majorite garnet, and then also in the, man in the slab there's this splitting where you actually have a positive, um, sorry, a dense a phase transition, a phase transition that's uplifted and actually helps the slab subduct from the majorite um, garnet to ilmenite phase transition. And this actually counteracts the resisting effect of these um, depressed phase transitions from the olivine, right? And notice also that these curves don't go through all of the layers because they're, they are compositionally dependent. Okay, so where does that lead us? So first I'm showing you here a model in which we do not have any phase transitions as so that you can see what the effect of these phase transitions are. In this model, the slab, um, you can see at the top that the trench can move backwards and forwards. And the um, subduction is fast initially with a lot of def deformation in the slab. But once the slab hits the 660, it shallows with time and it reaches sort of a steady state sort of deformation with very little actual strain rate or deformation in the deeper part of the slab. Okay, so let's contrast that with the next model, 
which has all of these phase transitions. Um, first of all, it sinks very rapidly at the beginning, and then it starts to get into this buckling and folding behavior in which the trench is moving forwards and backwards and the slab is folding and buckling in response to the combination of forces from all of the phase transitions, as well as this change in viscosity going from a nonlinear viscosity composite rheology in the upper mantle to a uh, um, linear viscosity with viscosity jump in the lower mantle. And it is really this time dependent behavior, this folding and buckling of the slab that leads to these regions of high strain rate within the slab that migrate as a function of time. So in the next picture right here, as you can see there are these sort of different sort of um, stages of the folding where there are, uh, the slab is be just beginning to fold in the first at 17 million years. It starts to fold and roll backwards at 21 million years that fold then sinks as a fold down through the transition zone until it just makes it through the transition zone. You end up with this sort of flat lying slab sitting at 660. And then slowly this will then um, return and start again to fold and buckle uh, and, and repeat this type of deformation. At each of these stages, you can see that the strain rate profile is different, right? And if this is the strain rate that's actually driving seismicity, what we would expect is that the pattern of deep seismicity would actually reflect the shape of the slab and its stage of folding or buckling as it sinks into the mantle. Um, for, um, I've, I think I want to point out at this point again that I didn't design these models to go after this question, so I had to come up with some sort of creative ways to think about like how do I interpret this information, how do I think about this, and remember that when we look at any particular subduction zone, we're only looking at a single snapshot in time, right? But there is a, um, a common method in geology, which is this sort of time for distance substitution. And when you look at um, this picture here of Tonga rotated on its side, okay, um, when any one part of this slab sort of folds or buckles or deforms, it will affect the adjacent section of the slab right, so that when a fold starts at one end of the slab, that fold might actually migrate through the slab so that there is um, distance could actually be telling us about like a time progression in the folding of the slab. I want to compare that here to a plot I made as a function of depth. What I did is I plotted the maximum strain rate um, along this 900 degree profile um, as a function of time, all right. So you can almost think of this as like if I had a 3D slab, I might expect folding to occur in one place and then migrate to an adjacent section. But what this is actually showing is as a function of time, how you would expect um, how the strain rate is changing and that you have these regions where you have very intense um, um, high strain rates where you'd expect intense seismicity, followed by times in which there's very low strain rate, maybe at intermediate depths, but you still have very high strain rates right around the 600 kilometer um, uh, depth. And this is actually varying in time. So when we look at any particular subduction zone, what we should think about is that we're only looking at a single time slice through some history of deformation. And we have to consider whether that seismicity, how it is reflecting the um, stage of, of deformation and how much deformation the slab is actually undergoing. And while I have Tonga up here, I'd say this is a, a, would be one very nice way of thinking about why does Tonga have so much more deformation, than, um, so much more seismicity than any other subduction zone. It is the most highly contorted subduction zone. And we know that it's in fact maybe even being squashed by another slab sinking on top of it. And that would suggest that the reason it has such high seismicity is in fact because it is deforming very rapidly compared to other slabs around the world. So I want to, um, for a second, zoom in on this peak that's around 600 kilometers and ask what's actually causing this uh, peak at 600 kilometers. Um, so if we look at a section of our um, slab between 600 and 700 kilometers, we see that this is a region where we have these um, splitting of these phase transitions. And in fact, there's actually like a garnet to virginite phase transition that's really only happening in the, in the Harzbergite phase, uh, Harzbergite layer of the slab. 
And it's right along, right in that region where we have this, a, a slight peak in seismicity. And this picture actually doesn't, the color doesn't actually show that this is actually fairly big. It's like half an order of magnitude. Um, and in some um, slices, it can be even bigger. When I saw um, this type of peak, this, this was very reminiscent of the um, South American subduction zone, which also seems to have this localization of stresses or strain rate um, deformation occurring at around 600 kilometers and is causing this band of deep seismicity that we see under South America. Um, what's interesting is that this can happen, right, even if there's very little deformation going above this point. And we can see this here, right, there are episodes um, in which you have this deep seismicity. Sometimes there's a high strain rate above it, but sometimes there's not. And this kind of thing would predict that you might have shallow seismicity at around 400 kilometers, intermediate depths, but also a peak in seismicity around 600 kilometers if the seismicity is being really driven by the rate of strain within the slab. Okay, so let me come back um, to the beginning and compare these, uh, these results with some observations a little bit more directly. Um, I'm just gonna show you some comparisons of model results with some profiles. Um, and I'll remind you that none of these slabs were designed to study these particular areas. But the idea is if that the strain rate is controlling where the seismicity happening happens, then it's really the shape of the slab and it's where it is in its deformation or history that is controlling where you have high strain rates and therefore that may be controlling where you have seismicity. So here's a profile that shows, a, you know, sort of almost linear type subduction um, shape. But you can see that there are regions of high deformation right around 400 kilometers. This slab is just about to start bending. And then there's also this peak um, at deeper depths, um, uh, which is reminiscent of what we see in Chile. As another example, here's um, one of those stages of folding. I've just flipped the picture from the model around in order to match this profile from Izu Bonin. Now, Isaboni has this amazing profile where this, the seismicity comes out almost flat, and then there's this earthquake sitting back here, really behind the slab. And that is reminiscent of this kind of folding, okay? This slab would have to be actually folded more tightly in order to match this, but you do see that this, this is, explains this um, increase in seismicity through the top of the fold, right? There's even a high strain rate region on this flat portion of the slab right before it bends but then you have very little seismicity behind, um, underneath it. And then the final example is from the Marianas. Um, a lot of people, when I first started showing models which had bent back slabs, said slabs don't look like that. <laughs> okay, here's a profile from Marianas. Turns out that if you look in, around, you'll find a, a good number of examples of slabs that are bent backwards. Um, and it, it turns out that even the distance between this seismicity and this seismicity is similar in this model. What's interesting here is that this shallow seismicity around 400 kilometers depth, if it's caused by high strain rates, our models would predict that this is actually happening on the bottom side of the slab, not on the top of the slab. Um, and that this deeper seismicity again is related to the extra um, um, stresses which cause yielding and higher strain rates um, within these region of multiple phase transitions happening at um, 660 kilometers. Okay, so to bring that all to conclusion. Um, I hope that I've showed to you today that the variations in strain rate in the models is consistent with observations, that large gaps in seismicity could be caused by regions of very low strain rate, variable peaks in seismicity are related to high strain rate bending regions in the slab, and it may even be that the abrupt cessation we see in seismicity below 660 kilometers could be due to the fact that the strain rates decrease rapidly as you go into a higher viscosity lower mantle. Um, all, uh, I've shown you also that the shear instability and transformational faulting mechanisms ex do explicitly depend on strain rate. But this parameter, if you read in the literature in deep earthquakes, nobody is really thinking about how you relate the strain rate dependence to where the seismicity is happening. Um, so I would conclude that the distribution of deep earthquakes are in fact determined by two factors. The cold temperatures required to get high enough stress and to store elastic strain and having variations in strain rates and high enough strain rate within deforming slabs in the mantle. 
the mechanism, whether it's transformational faulting or shear instability, answering that question will come from explicitly addressing the role of strain rate and stress together in how um, we actually can initiate these um, earthquakes with these mechanisms under the conditions we actually observe in deforming slabs. And I'll stop there. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, questions. Uh, Patrick, Cordier, do you want to ask, unmute and ask your question? Yes. Uh, hi, Magali. Very exciting talk. Well, I, I guess that the way the, the slab is folding and buckling depends on the, on the viscosity choices that you made and, and hence the strain rate probably. So can you comment on that? Yes. So in these models, we used a um, composite diffusion dislocation creep rheology for olivine with a fixed yield stress at depth. And um, the, the drawbacks to that is I think that in fact, the slab would be better um, approximated perhaps with a low temperature plasticity. Um, and my um, understanding, although I haven't done this yet, is that if we did that, we'd actually expect to have slightly higher strain rates within the slab. We would have a, a more easily deformable slab than we have using a, a one gigapascal yield stress within the slab. So, but that the that low temperature plasticity would still allow us to have high enough stress, right? But with more deformation. So I think we, in going forward, we do have to be careful about um, more accurately um, uh, representing the rheology within the slab and low temperature plasticity and also elasticity are going to be important for getting both the magnitude of the stresses correct as well as the orientation of stresses. Thank you. Yep. Uh, James Condor, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, terrific talk, Magali. Thank you. Uh, the strain rates you're showing, the, the have to have some sort of uh, you know tensor aspect to that, so it should predict a particular um, slip vector. Have you looked at the slip vectors with the earthquakes? So um, I, I haven't done that yet. You're correct. But we we I so what I have done is I've taken my strain rate tensor and I've looked at the principal um, um, the principal directions from the strain rate um, uh, tensor because this is a purely viscous model. Those would be the same as the principal stress directions. Um, and so I, I uh, in my paper, you can actually see plots where I also look, I plot the orientations of those stresses. And we do see that they vary locally and they actually, you can have places where you have down dip compression on the top of the slab that shifts, shifts the down dip compression on the bottom of the slab and overlaps with those regions of high um, strain rate. I haven't gone through the exercise of actually predicting slip vectors be, uh, mainly because of the question with the rheology. Without having elasticity, we in fact do not have our principal stresses rotating in the right part of the curve of our slab, right? Because um, once you add elasticity, you end up actually having a, a different, a slightly different relationship in terms of where you have um, your principal maximum st stresses and the orientation of those stresses. So before we would do that exercise, we would really need to move to a viscoelastic um, simulation of subduction to be able to more, more directly re predict what we would expect for fulcrum mechanisms and subdirections. Thank you. I think I answered Hirun's question. Yes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Chris Rollins, would you like to ask? You can read his question. Sure. Yeah. Do we know for sure that all all deep earthquakes occur in slabs as opposed to in the surrounding mantle? Um, we have examples from yeah. the shallow earth of earthquakes that appear to happen for no reason uh, by, right. by by compared to what you know we know about earthquakes like uh, Antarctic Plate 1998. Uh, could there be you know there, some yeah. episodic uncertainty that causes these these earthquakes that are off the rest of the slab, like in the plots you showed in the last section? Right. So, um, so there's a couple, two things I'll answer that. One is that I, people have shown that you can still get enough stresses in, um, in pieces of slab that have broken off. Um, and so that you can still get earthquakes sometimes within these pieces of slab that have broken off. This is um, yeah. like, for example, under Spain. In, in what understanding of where you see earthquakes that are like completely off the slab in the shallow mantle, for example, swarms of earthquakes going through the mantle wedge, 
is that this is related to fluids, right? And so if you can create a free fluid um, that is formed rapidly, right, then it's possible that you could have seismicity that is, um, is outside the slab if you can get fluids rapidly moving through the mantle. Um, it really depends on whether you have, if it's a rapid enough process, right? So that, that's a possibility. Um, and I think it's, you always have to be open to the, the, those other things that can be hap that can happen. Um, but we don't, I guess one difference is, is that we see that in shallow, in the shallow uh, mantle in terms of like swarms, which indicates that there's some sort of fluid process. And we don't see that same sort of behavior in the deep, for deep earthquakes. But I wouldn't rule it out, <laughs> right? We know that there's fluids down there. There's diamonds that show us um, extensive evidence of, you know, fluids that are, are forming in even sort of in the crustal warmer area of the slab that are probably responsible for, for forming diamonds in that area. So don't rule out fluids. Okay. Yeah, like when, when just when, <laughs> look, yeah, just looking at like the, uh, the, the Mariana cross section you showed it, there's the, there's the earthquake that's behind, or I think it's yeah. the, uh, the one before that, there's the earthquake that's back behind everything. And what if that's on some lifeboat of, of slab that broke off or something? But right anyway. down here yeah it's totally yeah that's possible um i guess the other option is that slabs are just bending yeah exactly so thank you yeah so and better better tomography right more special right. more focused topography would also help us to answer that question thank you yeah um we have a raised hand uh from ji yuan yao sorry if i mispronounced that Well, in the meantime, uh, oh, it might be my internet. Um, Ichin has a question in the chat here. Uh, a recent seismic study uh, suggests the presence of carbonate melts uh, that cause strong anisotropy at the deep earthquake source localities. How do you think the melt would affect the strain rate? Um, so, uh, so I guess this would come back to something similar to the thermal shear instability mechanism, right, where that mechanism is um, suggesting that the melt is actually the weakening mechanism that allows the earthquakes to occur. Um, the, the effect on seismic anisotropy and source uh, locations is interesting because that, if you can actually, one of the predictions from these models is that some of these earthquakes are actually happening not on the top portion or middle of the slab, but actually on the back of the slab where the strain rates are higher. And so being able to unravel the effect of strong anisotropy in source locations will be important for um, determining whether, you, where, whether you're actually having earthquakes on sort of the back part of the slab, not just the front part of the slab. Um, yeah. Oh, you also asked about if the strain rate corresponds to variations in B values of earthquakes. Um, so I haven't modeled explicit locations yet. And so in order to answer that question, I would have to make a model of, of Tonga, right? Of that, say, the correct age, the correct subduction, trying to actually match the variation in shape of the slab. Um, and then we might be able to make the link to specific um, observations of B values. But that would be an interesting question because we do see variation in B value, not only as a function of depth, but also from one region to another. Thank you for that. Uh, Min Chen, you have your hand raised. Yes. Hi, uh, Manly, a great talk. And I'm Min Chen from Michigan State University. Yes. Um, I'm, interesting, uh, I'm interested to know that how because uh, in, in your modeling, you're uh, assuming the phase transition in equilibrium state, right? And uh, how, how to actually incorporate the metastability in this kind of simulation? Right. So, um, so theoretically, we can do that. So this again comes back to we weren't. I didn't set these models up to do this. So of course, one of the next steps would be to actually set up models with um, with both equilibrium phase transitions and also. Uh, with a model of metastable um, olivine. Um, the one very uh, big difficulty with the metastable models is that it's highly dependent on what you assume for the kinetic um, inhibition of the reaction, and it's not very well constrained. So but I think that that is definitely a direction that we want to do, um, and, and then actually compare, right, how the slab 
the deformation is changed and then where the locations of high strain rate and low strain rate occur. So if, if this is something that couples with the transformational faulting mechanism, then we have to do those models with metastable olivine as well. Yes, that would be great. And I have one more question. If, sure. uh, yeah. um, so in your modeling results in these movies, uh, right, um, it seems that uh, after the slab penetrates the uh, 660 discontinuity it falls or it sinks pretty quickly and doesn't uh, get stagnated uh, uh, around that discontinuity region. Uh, but in actual, um, actually in isobonan region, right, as you can see from the um, seismicity distribution, especially for that very deep earthquake that happens at the uh, bending part, mm -hmm. um, that requires a very, uh, like, very compact folding instead yeah. of the yeah. Yeah. more elongated. Uh, yeah. how, how, how the viscosity change across the discontinuity would change the geometry or yeah. morphology? Of so the there, definitely yeah. there would be a feedback between our, our slab rheology and the, the, um, the viscosity variation across that boundary, as well as um, how we're actually modeling these phase transitions, right? So there's a, a, a a couple things there. So if the slab were actually slightly weaker, even with the same phase um, changes in viscosity very um, jump, we would get more bending of the slab in that area. And that might also then slow the slab down more, right, as it goes through here. One of the big differences between these models and other models that people have done is that because we're including the pyrexine phase changes, the olivine phase change is not able to slow down the slab as much as is, is um, occurs in other models in which you only include olivine phase changes. But when you do only include olivine on, only phase changes, you way over predict the density contrast caused by those phase transitions. And that's been shown before. Um, so what uh, I, I definitely, I know one problem with these models, of course, is we, these models don't produce flat slabs. We have to understand how we actually produce flats, really flat slabs, right? Um, and so perhaps a weaker slab these models do not have as much rollback as predicted or observed, I'm sorry, as observed in places where you do have flat slabs. And that also may be due to this, either the strength of the slab or the behavior of the shear zone in these models. So there's a lot of factors that might actually help to have more stagnation within a transition zone. Um, but I would argue that even when you do that, you're still going to have areas of bending and folding that give you high strain rate, very like regions of higher strain rate and lower strain rate. And so you still want to be thinking about that as a factor controlling the where, where you have deep seismicity. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. We have another question in the chat from G.I.D. Lee, if you'd like to unmute and ask uh, about high strain rate. I can just read it. If high strain rate does lead to peaks in seismicity, uh, which means earthquakes is the main way for stress releasing. Okay, so I, I um, so I don't think we can actually quantify yet how much of the um, the total internal strain rate within the slab is actually being released by seismicity. The one thing I can say is that what we what we predict for si for the total strain rate in the slab is at least comparable to what's being released seismically. Um, but I also already said that these slabs may be not deforming as fast as they would be if you had low temperature plasticity. So I would expect that seismicity would, would only release part of this, right? Um, and that in, um, and that in a, a slab that has a slightly better rheology and also has elasticity in it, which actually allows it to deform more also, um, we would, our models would predict higher strain rates than what we observe from seismicity, and therefore only a portion of the strain rate would be um, released seismically. But that's a question that we can't answer until we have a better rheology for these kinds of models, like a fuller, uh, more complete rheology. Thank you. Um, you can chime in if that, if you had a follow-up question. Um, and if not, uh, Jenny Collier. Did you want to ask your question? Yeah, I can ask my question. Um, thanks. So, uh, Magli, as you were coming to the last part of your 
talk, like, so like the panel we're looking at now, yeah. you know, showing your, your correlation between your predicted slab shapes, your strain rate and the observed earthquakes. I was expecting you to then bring in some tomographic images of the slices, but you didn't, so I wondered why. <laughs> for time. <laughs> um, oh, for and time. I'll, yeah, okay. and I'll, yeah, so if there are, um, uh, there are some papers in particular on this particular cross section of, this, of the Izu boning. Um, and so it, this particular area may be folded. Uh, and there's, oh, in one model, the, t the, the tomography shows that there's sort of a, a sort of bluish region here. There's another model that's, that was just done this year after this paper was already like in preparation that showed that the slabs might actually be torn here. So that you have one section that's flattening out and the section right next to it is sort of like flat and then broken. So um, it is necessary right, to actually try to couple this in with, um, with better tomography models. Uh, but I would also say that if, we, if you actually go around and try to start collecting tomography models of subduction zones, you'll find a lot of them for shallower, but this deep part in the transition zone is actually really hard to image, is my understanding. And so you really have to set up very specific um, experiments that are targeting this part of the slab. And that would be, of course, very helpful. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, Xi Xi Zhang, you had a question in the chat. Yeah, I'm gonna ask. Okay, um, well, Megli is really, uh, it's a really nice talk. I really enjoyed. Um, Thank you. Glad to see your paper, you know, published. Thank so, you. Yeah, uh, I, you already actually uh, acknowledges this, so I, I don't really want to push you too hard on this. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. You know, um, uh, I, you talked about the high viscosity for the slabs. Um, you're saying basically the slab viscosity is probably on the order of 10 to 24, 20, 10 to 25 Pascal second, uh, which is, you know, could be true, of course. Uh, and then, then this actually may bring to the issue that is. So you, as you mentioned, the viscoelastic uh, bending right. issues. And uh, we know that if viscosity is high, then that's when the elasticity starts kicking, yes. right? Um, so uh, it would be really, uh, as you uh, mentioned, it would be really interesting to look at how the how models like this can incorporate elasticity, which is not uh, easy to do. So, right? uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, but it's really interesting. I mean, I, I really start to see uh, the rationale behind all this bending, um, you know, folding that they, you know, uh, based on the seismicity, um, you know, detailed seismicity you showed here today, Thank you. Uh, which, you know, yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, I'll just let you know that I do have a, gra a graduate student whose PhD is going to be making um, viscoelastic models. Uh, the approach we're going to take for this is to take start out with 2D sections in which we extract the geometry of the slab from um, seismicity and tomography, and we create a, um, a model of the present day slab, but using viscoelastic um, rheology with low temperature plasticity. And then, um, and then actually calculating what the deformation is over sort of, you know, 500,000 to 1 million year time scale. Um, and then, and then specifically, then relating that to the observed seismicity um, within those particular locations. Um, so we think that that's probably the, the best way to start to get after this question because the geometry is going to be very important. And if we want to compare this to particular areas, we need to have the right geometry. And we don't know yet enough when we're doing these time-dependent models to start sometime in the past and get to the right geometry. Um, so we are going to actually start doing these kinds of models in the fall. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you. Uh, we have a hand raised. Uh, Pablo Aravina, if you'd like to ask the question. Hello. Uh, thank you for the talk. That was very interesting. It's a very interesting paper too. Thank you. Um, I was. I have a couple of questions in the sense that uh, of the model. Um, how does the model behave on a slab that has, say? A lower or higher subduction angle and different flow around it, mantle flow allowed. Mantle flow, the, yeah. <laughs> yeah, is, is it uh, sensitive to those conditions or? Um, so I would expect that if I had other slabs in here or I had um, mantle flow imposed from like some upwelling in the lower mantle, or if you did some sort of ad hoc thing where you added stress conditions to create a wind, 
that yes, this lab would feel that and would and that would affect its um, its uh, evolution. So these models really are. Um, that's one always one deficiency of doing subduction models is that we normally do them into an empty mantle, and I'm very much aware of that. Um, I personally have always been very focused on how the slab itself behaves and trying to understand that relationship. If I'm going to move to modeling a particular area, then I would start to think about more like what is the background conditions that would be really affecting this, the subduction dip within this particular area and the stresses on the slab. And in that case, you want to start considering either imposed boundary conditions, which are always a little bit scary, or trying to like add the most, the closest slab, right, that would actually affect this. Or like in Tonga, for example, we know that there's a large scale upwelling in the lower mantle um, that does affect the um, the stresses and deformation in the Tonga Kermadec subduction zone. So yes, all of those things would also have some bearing on this. It would need to be addressed in, in a regional context. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Ming Ming Li, you have a question in the chat. Hi, Ma Hi Mike, Mike Lee, thanks for your talk. Uh, you. The correlation between strain rate and the seismicity is, is very interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, I wonder how is there a way to do to calculate the strain instead of strain rate in your model? And uh, I, I'm not sure what's your comment. May perhaps strain is more meaningful for the deformation. Well, of course, both are meaningful, but right. It yeah. yeah. So let me make sure that I understand your question. So we, you're, you think that we sh should maybe focus more on the total strain because really when you're having an earthquake, it's the accumulation of strain that's important, not right. necessarily just the instantaneous strain rate. <clears throat> yeah. So uh, so in the mo in the models that I just talked about that we were preparing to do, that is something that we could we could look at, right? And and actually um, track the integrated strain within this sort of longer this time period up, up until the in, the the present day um, for these models we didn't I didn't try to do anything sort of backwards calculate and integrate strain within an area and also these are viscosity models so like a time step within what these models is like 10,000 years right whereas if you really want to look at the strain accumulation leading up to an earthquake you're going to have to look at a much shorter time scale but I do think these, you, these are all the directions I would love to see people going with this problem, not just me. Please, other people work on this. <laughs> um, because I, this is what we need to do in order to actually answer the question of what is this mechanism? Like, how are we actually getting these deep earthquakes? And, and get to sort of, you know, what are generally the, the mechanisms, but then also being able to identify um, when there's other special cases, like this other person asked about where, where water might actually have an impact. Um, so we need to be linking these long-term models, and maybe not as long-term as this, not 40 million years, but million-year timescale subduction models explicitly working on them to link them to present to the seismicity at the very short time scale. That's I think the only reason, only way that we'll actually get to the point where like here's the conditions in the slab and now let's actually try to model this triggering mechanism to see whether we can generate earthquakes with these conditions. So that's definitely the way we want it, the direction we should be going. Thank you. Yeah there are definitely lots of interesting things to do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Sean Wei, would you like to ask your question? Hi, Maggie. Um, it's nice. Uh, I, I'm, I have to say I'm amazed by the remarkable correlation between the strain rate and the, 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 the seismicity rate uh, here in your, I guess, paper uh, figure one and two. But then uh, I guess we, uh, you have already discussed a little about the uh, slab geometry, how, how that will affect but uh, we all know that, especially in the in the lower mantle, the slab geometry is on the debate. For example, the is is part. So, uh, given the remarkable correlation here, can we kind of go back because we have such a good uh, way to predict this? As means, can we say, okay, the the slab geometry in your model is the right one that can guide us for for tomography, or 
or or or in other way is that how sensitive your your models your your correlation depends on uh, depending on on slab geometry um, so uh that's a hard question to answer <laughs> so this because this what i've really focused on is in the upper mantle right where where we we know we have the earthquakes as you say to check this the, the slab geometry and make these comparisons but like i said before i wasn't i didn't try to reproduce isobonine i just happened to catch in my model a period of bending that seemed similar to the seismicity that we see in isobonine um i don't so I'm not sure that we're to the point where we can say, hey, take, these, take these models and actually predict what the shape of the slab should be in the lower mantle. In particular, some of the other things I already pointed out that like, I don't, these models don't produce enough rollback. They don't, they don't include the interaction with other slabs or lower mantle flow. All of those things would also affect how the slab deforms even as it goes into the lower mantle, right? Like if you have other flow coming up, that, that might actually affect the the shape of the slab, maybe even squash it more, right? Um, if you have these other forces that are not included here. Yeah, I understand there are a lot of uncertainties, but given yeah. such a remarkable correlation here, is that just a good accident or does that mean no. something? No, I think it means something. I think it means that really, if you have deformable slabs, mm -hmm. slabs that are strong, but actually deform, that you have that strain rate pattern um, is 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 co controlling where you have strain accumulation that's sufficient to cause earthquakes. That I think is totally um, a robust result of these models. When you want to move to particular regions, I don't think we're there yet. I think all of these things that I've already talked about: elasticity, having the right um, like that, the, actually the right age of the slab, um, and really the geometry that's observed that's necessary in order to make more progress um, to specifically understand the relationship between the seismicity and the strain rates. Okay, thank you for your question. Thank you. Okay, we have one last question from the chat uh, from Lung Jiang Shi. Um, basically trying to understand, is the high strain rate just a phenomenon that's happening at the same time as these earthquake or actually a mechanism for the intermediate and deep earthquakes? So uh, I think the way to think about this is that these, you should consider that the, the slab is deforming. In regions of very high strain rate, you're able to accumulate enough strain that then whatever mechanism is causing deep earthquakes, either shear instability, transformational faulting, or something else we haven't imagined yet, it, is, it creates the conditions in which there is a high enough stored strain within the slab that you can rupture within um, with a with an actual earthquake, rather than just having slow um, deformation, which is just accommodated through viscous flow, rather than a a, a brittle phenomenon um, being responsible and causing the earthquakes. Um, so it's it's you. I think of it as sort of background conditions. You need to be cold enough in order to be strong enough, and you also need to be you need to be deforming rapidly enough that you um, have the conditions necessary for a failure mechanism to, to even um, create an earthquake. Okay. Thank you. Um, if there are no further questions, I think Patrick says, I need a comment, strain rate builds stress. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, then yes, let's thank Megalie again for this interesting talk. Thank you for all the wonderful questions. Thank you. And thank you, Keely, for hosting us.